Okay, doctors, welcome back. We are going to start the next lecture, which is large intestines, given by Dr. Mark Singer. Please welcome back, Dr. Singer. Okay, thank you. All right, so the next hour will be on uh, colon surgery. Here are my disclosures. Here's a list of the included topics. Okay, so we're gonna start with uh, appendix. We'll open with a case. A 55-year-old gentleman underwent a laparoscopic appendectomy and was found to have invasive adenocarcinoma measuring 1.8 centimeters located at the tip of the appendix. The most appropriate next step is A, ileocecectomy, B, close observation and annual CAT scan, C, octreotide scan, D, right hemicolectomy, E, genetic counseling. Go ahead and enter your answers. Okay, good. Most people chose correctly. D, right hemicolectomy. So appendiceal cancers uh, are a relatively rare group of cancers found in less than 1% of appendectomy specimens. Um, a variety of tumors are found in the appendix, both epithelial and non-epithelial tumors. The most common non-epithelial tumor is carcinoid, and we'll talk about that. The most common epithelial is going to be mucinous adenocarcinoma. Um, amongst the epithelial tumors, you see here uh, sort of a spectrum of uh, benign adenomas all the way up to adenocarcinomas. Uh, also in the appendix, you may find endocrine tumors, um, goblet cell tumors, lymphoma, and sarcoma. These, of course, are relatively rare, but occasionally will turn up on appendectomy specimens. Now, in the non-epithelial tumors, uh, most often uh, we're talking about carcinoids. So these are going to be found most commonly at the tip. And as we discussed uh, earlier, the treatment for this is based in part on the, the size. So small tumors, meaning less than one centimeter, uh, typically appendectomy alone is sufficient treatment. Um, for large tumors, more than two centimeters, a right colectomy is indicated. And then for the in-between tumors, between one and two centimeters, it depends a little bit. Uh, if the if the tumor is at the tip and the base is free and there's an obvious margin, uh, that may be okay. Um, however, it's important to look at the histology. If it's a high-grade tumor, if there's lymphovascular invasion, if uh, uh, the mesoappendix is involved, any of these concerning features, then you should proceed to right colectomy. Um, goblet cell tumors, uh, again, very rare, um, but you should keep in mind um, these patients typically will also present with uh, appendicitis. These tumors um, have high metastatic potential. Uh, they're different than typical carcinoids in that they don't have carcinoid syndrome. Now, of the epithelial tumors, the, the main thing you want to keep in mind is um, the mucinous tumors. So these are sometimes just incidental, uh, incidentally found at the time of appendectomy. <laughs> Uh, but sometimes present atypically. Uh, they may present as a mass, chronic pain, or even obstructive symptoms. Unfortunately, uh, at the time of operation, these patients may already have disseminated uh, mucinous cancer. And you see a, a photo and a CT scan here of what that might look like. They should be worked up both with imaging and tumor markers. And uh, if not disseminated, they should undergo a right colectomy as definitive treatment. But in those patients that do have disseminated disease, they should be considered for cytoreductive uh, surgery. All right, we'll talk a bit about appendicitis. Uh, although common and typical, important to remember some of the sort of fundamentals as, as these do come up on the exam. Clearly, patients present with right lower quadrant pain and tenderness. Um, but uh, just to sort of remind ourselves, the iliopsoas test, um, patients will have uh, pain with extension of the right thigh when patients are lying on their left side. Um, it's important to remember these things, even though patients, everybody is pretty much getting a CT scan. Exam questions sometimes will describe a patient who has this finding, pain with extension of the thigh, what's the appropriate treatment, appendectomy. So it's sort of the two-part question. You have to know the diagnosis and the treatment based on that. <clears throat> 
Uh, also the obturator test, pain with internal rotation of the thigh, again, because of the inflamed appendix, uh, will become irritated by um, the obturator internus. And Robzing sign, uh, as we remember from medical school and residency, pain in the right lower quadrant with palpation in the left lower quadrant. Uh, imaging, of course, most people are going to undergo a CT scan. Occasionally, ultrasound, especially in children, uh, is, is sometimes uh, employed. Um, timing of surgery in general and emergent operation should be done uh, immediately or for sure within 24 hours, preferably within eight hours. There's a growing uh, body of literature uh, supporting the treatment of um, appendicitis with IV antibiotics alone. And you can make a, a fair argument based on data for that, but for the purpose of the exam, in general, you're going to want to just proceed to appendectomy and avoid any type of controversy. Um, issues of laparoscopy versus open, um, probably equivalent outcomes. Uh, laparoscopy has uh, clearly become more common and popular amongst most surgeons, but uh, nothing wrong with doing an open appendectomy. Uh, now, perforated appendicitis uh, sometimes will present with an unusual or delayed presentation. Um, as you know, patients will have sometimes pain, not severe enough that they come to the hospital, but will present five days, seven days later with worsening pain, fevers, uh, or signs of sepsis. All these patients, of course, should be imaged with CT scan. And then the decision is uh, immediate appendectomy or medical treatment followed by <coughs> interval appendectomy. Um, both are probably acceptable depending on the patient's particular circumstances. So they should be evaluated with imaging. If there is an abscess, that of course should be drained. Doing appendectomy in the setting of perforation with abscess is usually not the best uh, choice because you're likely to encounter a difficult dissection and put the patient at risk of more complications. A patient who has a perforation with some free air on their skin, but not a big abscess, not a big phlegma, and those are people who are going to probably do better with uh, an immediate appendectomy. They're treated and done. Now, patients who have a large phlegma, an abscess, et cetera, and that you manage with drains and antibiotics uh, can be treated non-operatively and then can be offered an interval appendectomy at a later time. Um, these patients should be treated uh, uh, with post-operative antibiotics. The regimen is sort of your choice, uh, so long as you're covering the usual colon flora, including anaerobes, gram-negatives. A uh, few special populations. Elderly patients, appendicitis uh, definitely becomes less frequent in patients more than 65. Sometimes uh, their, t their presentation can be atypical. They have less pain in some circumstances, uh, but should be imaged and treated uh, as with younger patients. Pregnancy, this uh, often comes up, um, appendicitis in the pregnant patient. Uh, appendectomy is actually the most common non-obstetric indication for surgery in, in this population. And uh, performing early appendectomy is really the key to a good outcome. So uncomplicated appendicitis still, of course, carries some risk of fetal loss uh, in the range of 5%, relatively low, but obviously catastrophic for the, the patient. Um, but, and so although patients are reluctant to undergo surgery while pregnant, important to counsel them that the risk of fetal loss is upwards of 25% if their appendix should perforate. So for that reason, it's uh, usually justified to accept the risks related to surgery in the pregnant patient because if they progress to perforation, much higher risk. Keep in mind the appendix is often uh, located uh, more cephalad or much more cephalad uh, related to the gravid uterus. CT scan for most of these patients is still an acceptable option, uh, especially in the later uh, uh, weeks of pregnancy. And laparoscopic appendectomy also acceptable. Uh, chronic appendicitis, occasionally this comes up as a, a question, um, an uncommon condition, um, and patients will present with chronic uh, or intermittent recurring pain in the right lower quadrant. This can obviously be deceptive as patients who have recurrent pain. Usually uh, appendicitis is not going to be the first on your differential, uh, but it definitely uh, can happen, and they should be imaged and evaluated um, with CT scan as with acute presentation. Um, Acute appendicitis sometimes can resolve spontaneously but occur subsequently in a sort of milder uh, form. Um, and again, this can be a, a confusing diagnosis, um, but appendectomy should be offered. Laparoscopic appendectomy, uh, a technique that probably most uh, everybody here is quite familiar with. 
um, open appendectomy now, we have to sort of remind ourselves still a good uh, technique. So either answer would be acceptable on uh, board type questions. Okay, moving on to C. diff colitis, uh, really becoming an important issue as it's now the leading cause of hospital acquired infections and not only that, um, much more common as a community acquired infection. It, it used to be that patients really only had C. diff or uh, presented with C. diff when they were in the hospital or nursing home setting, but now patients are coming from home uh, and seemingly healthy normal patients are coming uh, with a C. diff infection. So there's a wide range of disease from mild disease with just some diarrhea uh, to fulminant colitis uh, and this can be a fatal infection. Uh, still the risk factors are important. Any history of antibiotic treatment within the previous three months or so uh, is an important risk factor and this will always be uh, the risk presented to you in these questions. Patient has sinusitis or some relatively innocuous infection and they undergo treatment as an outpatient and then six weeks later. It doesn't have to be while they're in the hospital getting IV antibiotics for uh, pneumonia or something. It can be even a fairly remote history of antibiotics. Patients uh, also at higher risk um, if immunosuppression related to um, HIV, chemotherapy, any of that. Uh, post-op patients um, who have multiple risk factors, immunosuppression related to their post-operative status, and also they've all received antibiotics and bowel preps uh, which have altered their flora. Medical comorbidities, prolonged stay in the hospital and nursing home residents. So CT scan helpful in the evaluation. It's gonna be sensitive for their colitis but of course it's not specific. Typically the colon will appear thicken. Commonly these patients will have uh, some degree of ascites. Um, C. diff uh, toxin assay from their uh, stool is going to, of course, be uh, the most specific. Now, classically, we describe uh, pseudomembranous colitis. Uh, the appearance of pseudomembranes on endoscopy um, could be very helpful, although it's not that sensitive. Only around 30% of cases in some series can you identify the pseudomembranes. Um, patients are all managed medically initially. Uh, stopping the antibiotics uh, that were driving this infection, if you can. This is not always possible in some patients, especially in the hospitalized patients. If they're being treated for other severe infections like pneumonia or whatever, uh, they often need to stay on those. But if you can, stop their other antibiotics. Treat them specifically for C. diff, flagell and vancomycin, uh, oral or in enema form uh, are both good choices, hydration, fluid and electrolyte support and all that. Um, important to stop antidiarrheals. Patients who especially uh, develop symptoms at home and are treated in the outpatient setting are started frequently on antidiarrheals like Imodium, um, but it's important to stop that because the C. diff toxin can accumulate within their colon and they can get sicker. So definitely stop the antidiarrheals if they're on them. Patients who have chronic or recurrent C. diff, um, you should consider a prolonged course of oral vancomycin. Usually this is done as a six week taper. Um, you can consider adding rifaximin or fedoxamycin, this is um, Difficid, uh, which is an antibiotic specifically indicated only for C. diff. Now in patients who uh, are in the hospital and have fulminant colitis, uh, oftentimes do require surgery for this infection, and the treatment for these patients is emergent total abdominal colectomy with ileostomy. Um, and that's really the, the only choice that you should consider. Even if, uh, say, their proximal colon looks normal, they should undergo a total abdominal colectomy with endileostomy. Of late, there's been some consideration of ileostomy and uh, colonic irrigation. Uh, I would strongly recommend for the purpose of this exam, uh, always go with total abdominal colectomy, um, even if ileostomy is something that you employ in your own practice. Okay, ischemic colitis. So ischemic colitis, uh, is gonna be more often an issue on the left colon uh, than the right colon. You see here a picture, uh, an illustration of the arterial anatomy of the colon and we remind ourselves of the uh, so-called watershed areas, Griffith's point up near the splenic flexure and Sudex point. This is the areas of intersection of the arterial supply and sometimes can lead to an area of relative ischemia. And so these are the areas at highest risk of uh, colonic ischemia, but certainly not the only areas at risk. Patients presenting with ischemic colitis will have abdominal pain, bloody diarrhea, fever, perhaps elevated white count. Uh, and these patients definitely have sort of a spectrum. Sometimes they have some mild abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea, but they can also present uh, profoundly 
uh, ill and unstable. Now, patients with mild disease can uh, often be managed medically with fluid and electrolyte support, broad-spectrum antibiotics, and they will sometimes recover, but obviously if they become unstable, uh, you worry about um, necrosis, perforation, et cetera, and they require colectomy. Patients typically undergo diagnosis with a CT scan to image uh, uh, certainly for perforation, but also to evaluate for colonic wall thickening, understand the anatomy of the, which portion of the colon is involved. Angio, uh, not usually uh, particularly helpful, and although attempting to do endoscopy, uh, you have to use uh, significant caution because if the colon is somewhat tenuous, insufflating it with air or carbon dioxide can precipitate a perforation. Similarly, gastrographin enema, probably not that helpful in this setting and puts the patient at risk of perforation. Um, oops, sorry. So treatment, again, in the patients with mild disease, um, ball rest, broad-spectrum antibiotics, and most of these patients, fortunately, will recover. Um, it's important to follow them closely, and failure to improve after a couple of days of treatment, and certainly if they worsen, uh, should be considered for surgery. And that would be uh, basically to resect their necrotic bowel. Um, almost always, uh, for the purpose of uh, these types of uh, board questions, you're going to want to construct an ostomy, uh, perhaps if they have a short segment of ischemic colon and they're otherwise reasonably fit, you might consider an astomosis, but be safe. Just do a, a, an ostomy on these patients and usually uh, you can't go wrong with that. Um, now if you treat them medically and they recover, um, not uncommon to have long-term consequences uh, such as stricture. So like any ischemic structure, as it heals, the fibrotic reaction can lead to a stricture, and so these patients may still require surgery at a later time, but even if that's the case, doing it under more controlled circumstances is going to go smoother than doing it emergently. Okay, we'll now move on to cancer. So we'll, we'll start with the case here. At colonoscopy, a 1.7 centimeter pedunculated polyp was removed from the sigmoid colon. The pathology revealed a focus of well-differentiated adenocarcinoma involving the neck of the polyp. The margin is not involved. The most appropriate approach for this patient is chemoradiation only, colonoscopic re-resection of the polypectomy site, no further treatment, repeat colonoscopy in six months, anterior resection, chemotherapy only. Go ahead and enter your answers. Okay, good. No further treatment, repeat endoscopy only. So this is a patient that has cancer in a polyp, and as you can see from the description, it is a pedunculated polyp uh, with a completely resected malignancy, negative margin, and so this patient should, uh, well differentiated uh, cancer on the histology, so this patient should be adequately treated and should only be uh, followed. Um, Pathogenesis of colon cancer, this comes up often on the exam. Uh, you should know the genetic changes associated with colon cancer. Um, oftentimes there will be questions. Um, it doesn't ask specifically what are the genetic changes, but it will say in a patient who, un for example, in the last question undergoes that type of polypectomy, what type of genetic changes do they have? And so you need to understand that APC, KRAS, DCC, P53 are all associated with colon cancer. And then also mismatch repair genes, and we'll talk more about that. Now the treatment of colon cancer obviously is primarily surgical, and uh, colectomy uh, for no negative cancers uh, is going to be definitive uh, therapy. Remember that uh, 12 lymph nodes is sort of the magic number that we're looking for. Colectomy with 12 lymph nodes uh, is recommended to get adequate sampling uh, for staging purposes and can help us make a, a good decision about post-operative th uh, adjuvant therapy. Uh, adjuvant therapy can be considered for patients who are young or have high-risk features such as uh, colon obstruction or proximal perforation related to obstruction or in patients that are MSI stable on their uh, tumor. Now, node positive cancer, regardless of the T stage, should always be offered chemotherapy. So they should undergo resection and then postoperative therapy, and that would typically be with either full FOX or full FURY. So knowing all the stages is certainly helpful, but usually the, the main decision-making point is going to be 
no positive or no negative cancer regarding postoperative chemotherapy. Uh, other kinds of tumors, again, carcinoid uh, does uh, occur in the colon, similar presentation to the other locations as we've already discussed. Um, criteria for radical versus local resection, again, similar to appendix. Um, small tumors can be locally resected. This is going to be more of an issue in the rectum. We'll talk about that. Uh, in the colon, it's difficult to do a local resection only, uh, so usually these people get a radical resection, meaning a colectomy. GIST tumor, again, this is most common in the rectum, not so much in the colon. Uh, these patients will often present with bleeding, although not a mucosal tumor. Sometimes it will erode through the mucosa from within the wall. Uh, these should be completely excised, either by transanal excision, uh, a local excision, or if necessary, then a, a radical excision, like a low anterior resection. These patients can undergo um, post-operative Gleevec treatment if Patients have large bulky tumors, sometimes neoadjuvant treatment with Gleevec can be helpful to facilitate uh, the operation. Uh, other tumors, lyomyomas, usually small incidental findings uh, detected at colonoscopy. These can be removed endoscopically. Um, squamous uh, tumors uh, occasionally are identified in the colon. These often present with advanced disease, should be treated with a radical excision. And primary colonic lymphoma, uh, patients um, will present with pain, mass, bleeding, again, uh, surgical excision to treat these symptoms. Uh, these patients will generally be treated with chemotherapy, but if they're presenting with these types of symptoms, like pain and bleeding, uh, those should be addressed with colectomy. Uh, colonic Crohn's disease, we've already discussed Crohn's in the small bowel, but uh, certainly occurs in the colon. Um, the treatment, of course, depends on the uh, symptoms, mild symptoms treated uh, with anti-inflammatory and biologic therapy and steroids, as we have already discussed. But patients uh, sometimes may be presenting with fulminant colitis or toxic megacolon. These patients should be uh, briefly resuscitated and then taken rapidly to the operating room, uh, either for a colectomy or if uh, the patient is um, uh, becoming or is unstable, then uh, treatment with uh, transverse colostomy uh, is an option for the most uh, severely ill patients. But in general, um, rapid um, uh, medical management followed by uh, subtotal colectomy. Uh, Crohn's disease certainly can cause strictures in the colon. Patients with IBD who have strictures, you should be very suspicious for colorectal cancer. So these should be um, evaluated endoscopically, biopsied aggressively to really be sure. If the stricture is severe enough, they should undergo colectomy. Um, intractability, again, as with small bowel disease, patients who are refractory to medical management, un unable to wean steroids, non-responsive to biologics, any of those things, colectomy is a good option. Um, of course, dysplasia or malignancy. So malignancy is, is pretty clear. Um, in general, patients with Crohn's disease who have a malignancy should undergo uh, an extended resection like a subtotal colectomy, um, uh, if not a proctocolectomy. Um, now, dysplasia, so patients with IBD undergoing their usual surveillance um, endoscopies often will be found to have dysplasia, uh, and those with uh, dysplasia should be offered a colectomy as well. Segmental resection is acceptable in isolated disease, meaning if they have uh, segmental disease, um, it's not necessary to do a subtotal colectomy um, based on their disease. Again, if they have cancer, you should consider the extended resection, but if it's just for inflammatory disease, then it would be acceptable to do uh, a hemicolectomy. Okay, we'll talk uh, some about polyps. So typical polyps, neoplastic polyps, adenomas, uh, as you see here. We know the different varieties of adenomas, tubular adenomas, villus, tubulovillus, and serrated. Uh, but also, it's not uncommon to receive questions about the hematomatous polyps. We talked already about um, putz jaeger syndrome, which are uh, hematomatous polyps, and also juvenile polyposis syndrome. Um, inflammatory polyps, um, seen uh, often in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. You'll see the pseudopolyps, which are not really polyps. Those are uh, basically islands of normal mucosa surrounded by ulcerated um, areas, um, or sometimes benign lymphoid polyps. Uh, and lastly, hyperplastic polyps, not uncommon to see in the colon. Management, most polyps can be adequately treated endoscopically, so pedunculated polyps can be snared. 
efforts should be made to snare these in one piece rather than piecemeal, if possible. And that's uh, because if there is a malignancy within that polyp, uh, uh, an in block resection may be adequate treatment, as we saw in the case discussed. So, cancer in a polyp, um, if it's pedunculated and adequately resected, meaning a negative margin, and it's um, got cancer in the middle, that endoscopy with polypectomy alone is enough. If it's done piecemeal, even if the margins appear negative, that patient should be offered a uh, resection because it becomes unreliable once you do a piecemeal polypectomy. Uh, similarly, sessile polyps, if there's cancer in a sessile polyp, that patient should be offered a colectomy. But in general, uh, most benign sessile polyps that are small can still be safely removed endoscopically. The biggest polyps uh, are often removed piecemeal, um, and that's basically just uh, snare polypectomy in multiple pieces. So uh, polypectomy certainly has complications. Perforation is uh, the one we worry the most about. If a patient uh, has a small perforation um, and uh, they had a good bowel prep and their colon is otherwise normal and postoperatively they have some pain and an x-ray shows some free air, these patients are okay to manage non-operatively. Putting them on bowel rest and antibiotics and close observation is an acceptable uh, management strategy. If, of course, they have peritonitis, sepsis, uh, become unstable in any way, they should undergo uh, an operation. Um, bleeding, either immediate or delayed. Sometimes patients uh, undergoing polypectomy can have bleeding that is uncontrollable by endoscopic methods, or they may undergo a successful polypectomy and go home and bleed uh, in the first couple of days after the procedure. Most of the time, this will stop spontaneously, but like any GI bleed, uh, they need to be managed carefully because you don't know and cannot predict who's going to stop spontaneously or not. Sometimes colonoscopy can be performed emergently to look at the site, and if you can identify the bleeding site, you can inject it with epinephrine, apply hemostatic clips, you can snare, if there's some of the stock left, you can snare it and cauterize it. So there's a variety of techniques you can do to uh, stop the bleeding if you can identify it. If you cannot, or patients uh, you do not think are, um, if, uh, if it's a delayed bleed and they're not prepped and you're not comfortable with that, uh, angiogram would be an option. These, of course, are very small vessels. These are not like big vessels that are bleeding, so sometimes that can be challenging, but certainly is possible. And then rarely, colectomy, uh, if, especially if the patient becomes unstable, uh, colectomy would be the option of last resort. Okay, we talked about some of the polyposa syndromes already. Uh, we'll get back to some of the others, and we'll, we'll start with a case. Which of the following best describes hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer syndrome, HNPCC? Mutation in the APC gene causes the syndrome. Microsatellite instability is rare. The penetrance rate is less than 25%. Mutation in MMR gene causes the syndrome or it is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder? Go ahead and enter your answers. Okay, so uh, most people answered correctly. Um, D, mutation in MMR gene causes the syndrome. Several people answered APC, we'll, we'll talk about that. So when it comes to the colonic polyposa syndromes, we'll start here with a discussion of FAP, familial adenomatous polyposa. So this is an autos autosomal dominant uh, syndrome, and this is the one caused by the APC gene mutation. So, um, uh, these are the patients who are easy to diagnose on colonoscopy because they have more than 100, often hundreds of polyps. Uh, so even just with uh, usually a flex sig, you can make the diagnosis very rapidly. All of these patients will have colon cancer by the time they get to be 50. Uh, as we talked about with the small bowel lecture, adenomas can occur not just in the colon, but also in the duodenum and the small intestine, so they need to be fully evaluated for that. Uh, now, in a family that you know uh, has FAP, screening begins when children are in the 10 to 15 your old range uh, with flexible sigmoidoscopy uh, and upper endoscopy at a little bit later age, usually by 21 to 25 or 30 years old. Treatment, of course, is proctocolectomy, uh, but they do have several choices. Uh, they can undergo a restorative proctocolectomy with ileopouchanal anastomosis. Uh, 
Um, patients who have a minimal polyp burden in the rectum can be offered a total abdominal colectomy with ileorectal anastomosis, provided they have a small number of polyps that you can control endoscopically. In other words, if you do serial proctoscopy or sigmoidoscopy and you can, uh, if you can stay ahead of the polyps in the rectum, that would be a reasonable option. Um, the most definitive, though, of course, is proctocolectomy with endileostomy. Uh, many patients would prefer not to have a lifetime ileostomy, which is why the ileal pouch is appealing for some of these patients. Um, patients with FAP are at risk of developing desmoids. Somewhere around 15% of patients will um, develop desmoids. These can be minor in the abdominal wall, but they can be quite significant and be a cause of death uh, of patients uh, because um, of their local destruction and obstruction of surrounding structures. Now getting to HMPCC or Lynch syndrome as in the, the case that was presented. So this is caused by an error in mismatch repair genes, MMR. Um, these patients have tumors that are, uh, have microsatellite instability. This is also an autosomal dominant. Now not 100% of, of patients will have a colon cancer, but uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70% of these patients will develop a colorectal cancer. Um, these are more often right-sided, uh, but certainly not always. Um, Interestingly, they have a better prognosis stage for stage than um, spontaneous colorectal cancers. Colon cancers as part of HMPCC uh, should be treated, uh, of course, with surgery, uh, but these patients should be offered a subtotal colectomy with an ileorectal anastomosis. The reason being that in patient with um, HMPCC and a colon cancer, if they undergo a segmental resection, a standard resection, they have upwards of 50% chance of a second cancer. And so a subtotal colectomy can uh, reduce uh, the chance of subsequent cancers. Also, these patients are at high risk of other cancers, uh, most notably uh, uterine cancer, stomach, uh, GU cancer, um, like uh, urine collecting uh, system, ureteral cancers. Uh, they should undergo a aggressive screening in uh, family members or patients with known mutations. Um, annual colonoscopy starting at the age of 20 or 25 and endometrial aspiration also starting at a young age. And this, these, uh, the colonoscopy needs to be done every one to two years because these patients are on an accelerated pathway. It's not five or ten years like with normal patients. Uh, they can present with advanced adenomas or cancers on a very short timeline, meaning one to two years. Um, uh, there's some difference in the presentation of patients with Lynch um, described are the Lynch 1 and Lynch 2. They all have uh, colorectal cancers. Uh, in the Lynch 1 classification, uh, there's a, a predisposition to more right-sided lesions and they have early onset colon cancers. In the Lynch 2, um, more of a predisposition for other uh, cancers outside of the colon, specifically the endometrial and ovarian. Okay. Uh, volvulus. So the initial treatment of uncomplicated sigmoid volvulus is uh, barium enema, sigmoid resection, endoscopic detorsion, sigmoid apexy, or Hartman's procedure. Uncomplicated sigmoid volvulus. Okay, right, endoscopic detorsion. Most of us chose that answer. So let's talk about volvulus for a bit. So we'll start with cecal volvulus. Um, cecal volvulus tends to occur in younger patients, more common in women. Um, this is um, somewhat different than the cecal bascule, which is more of a folding of the cecum uh, in a superior direction. Um, often it's um, considered the same or sort of categorized with volvulus, although it is a different entity. Um, these patients have a mobile cecum. Um, sometimes it's related to prior surgery, perhaps uh, uh, kidney surgery or something like that, and their cecum has already been mobilized. Sometimes can be precipitated by pregnancy with the upward pressure of the gravid uterus. Treatment for cecal volvulus, the most definitive treatment would be right colectomy with ileocolic anastomosis. Um, depending on the patient's condition and the quality of their small bowel, they, uh, you may choose to do an endileostomy, always a safe choice. Uh, 
So if they present with a volvulus and they're stable and the ileum looks normal, then an anastomosis would be fine. In patients who are um, hypotensive, malnourished, the ileum is greatly distended and looks very thin and not healthy, end ileostomy. Always be safe with this. Um, some have uh, suggested that uh, cecopexy is a reasonable treatment. Um, it will have a higher recurrence rate. Cecostomy would be required to decompress uh, the massive cecum. Uh, right colectomy is going to be the more definitive option in patients who are medically fit to undergo that operation. Moving on to sigmoid volvulus. So patients uh, who present with sigmoid volvulus are usually going to be older patients, uh, oftentimes infirmed or nursing home type residents, um, and they'll generally have a history of chronic severe constipation. That's not always the case, but typically uh, that's the kind of patient that is going to be described to you on this exam. Um, this is an x-ray that uh, is often on these exams, and you see here the uh, um, giant distended sigmoid colon, typically pointing to the right upper quadrant. So just a reminder, the cecal volvulus sort of points to the left upper quadrant, and the sigmoid volvulus points to the right upper quadrant, also described as the coffee bean sign, because you see here the bean with sort of that line in the middle. If the diagnosis is unclear, either CT scan or an old-fashioned contrast enema can be helpful. You see here the acute cutoff at the point of volvulus. Treatment of volvulus, uh, the initial treatment in addition to rehydration and resuscitation should be endoscopic detorsion. So for sigmoid volvulus, this is highly successful. Rigid uh, proctoscopy or flexible sigmoidoscopy um, around 75%, 80% of the time is successful in acutely detorsing the, the colon. Um, a rectal tube can be left to help with ongoing decompression and help uh, facilitate bowel preparation because these patients should undergo a sigmoid resection on the same admission. Although the rate of detorsion with endoscopy is very high, the rate of recurrence is also very high. So you can untwist it, but they're going to recur, and so the best uh, choice would be to offer them sigmoid resection on the same admission. Don't send these people home for an elective sigmoid resection later do it on the same admission. And then you can choose between an anastomosis or an end colostomy based on all the usual things, patient condition, nutrition, medical comorbidities, and the quality of the, of the descending colon. Uh, be liberal to give somebody an end colostomy. It's always a safe choice. Okay, lower GI bleeding. A 60-year-old man presents with massive lower GI bleeding due to diverticulosis. The best diagnostic and treatment modality is A, colonoscopy, B, CT scan, C, tagged RBC scan, D, arteriography, or E, ciliotomy. Okay, good. Arteriography. So angiography, um, is the correct answer here because it's asking for the best diagnostic and treatment modality. Yes, colonoscopy is a good diagnostic modality, um, but it's difficult uh, to treat massive bleeding uh, related to diverticulosis. So, of course, there's a lot of things that cause lower GI bleeding. Here you see a partial uh, list, diverticular disease, angiodysplasia, ischemia, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, tumors, not usually going to cause massive bleeding, but it's possible. NSAID-related colitis, Meckel's, and anorectal disease. Don't forget to evaluate things like hemorrhoid bleeding. Uh, with diverticular bleeding, um, the, the workup is going to be um, uh, the same as with uh, any patient who presents uh, with massive bleeding. Uh, resuscitation, IV access, all those types of things physical exam, even if you uh, feel like it's most likely diverticular bleeding, uh, don't miss the easy things like hemorrhoid bleeding. It certainly can happen and would be embarrassing to take out somebody's colon when they have bleeding hemorrhoids. Always exclude upper GI sources. We all know this, but don't forget those fundamentals. Um, NG tube with lavage until bilious return. Sometimes uh, that happens automatically. Sometimes it doesn't happen at all, but for the purposes of this exam, always stick with the fundamentals. So in pa patients with very brisk bleeding, if not massive bleeding, angiography is going to be a very good diagnostic modality. 
Uh, keep in mind, the rate of bleeding required to see an angiography is around one liter milliliter per minute. Um, these are numbers that are good to remember, about a milliliter per minute. Uh, nuclear scan, tagged RBC scan, also good. It's much more sensitive and requires only 0.1 milliliters per minute, 0.1 milliliters per minute, because angiography is imaging uh, real-time blood loss, right? You're seeing the vessel as it's bleeding, as the contrast is extravasating. The nuclear scan is really measuring the collection or accumulation of blood in the colon, and so that's why it's more sensitive, and you can measure or you can detect only 0.1 uh, per minute. Um, somewhere in between, colonoscopy is going to be a, a good way to go. With massive bleeding, colonoscopy is, of course, difficult. You just can't see. Um, with minor bleeding, colonoscopy might miss it. It's just not bleeding enough. But those are going to be the options, uh, angiography, colonoscopy, nuclear scan. And again, usually for massive bleeding, go to angiography. For small bleeding, slow bleeding, nuclear scan is going to be a good choice. Now, operative therapy. So who needs an operation for bleeding? Patients who become unstable, they get an operation. Um, but patients who are in the hospital and you're managing medically, uh, when do you operate on them? Uh, a general guideline has been six units of RBCs, so it's somewhere after six to eight units of transfusion, you should uh, strongly consider going to the operating room. If you know the source or even have localized the side of bleeding, then a segmental resection is the way to go. And geography will tell you very specifically where the bleeding is. Tagged RBC scan usually tells you left side or right side, and that's okay because if you know which side, you can offer a segmental resection, which is a good choice. If, however, you're unable to localize the bleeding and you find yourself taking the patient to the operating room, those people should undergo a subtotal colectomy or a total abdominal colectomy. So this comes up uh, from time to time, both in practice but also on these exams. If a patient has bleeding, you cannot localize, they need a total abdominal colectomy. And again, ileostomy versus ileorectal anastomosis, depending on the patient condition and all that. Uh, mortality rate is definitely higher for an emergent total abdominal colectomy, so you should try hard to avoid that operation. That's why all the emphasis on the localizing studies, um, not just so you can, uh, like with angiography, you can uh, intervene and stop the bleeding, even if you're not able to stop the bleeding, it's better to localize to, so you can bring the patient for a segmental resection. All right, diverticulitis. A 55-year-old man had three previous attacks of uncomplicated diverticulitis. He is most at risk for A, formation of diverticular stricture, B, another attack of uncomplicated diverticulitis, C, colonic perforation, D, diverticular abscess, E, sigmoid volvulus. Okay, great. Most people answered correctly. Uh, B, another attack of uncomplicated diverticulitis. So acute diverticulitis uh, can sometimes present as mild disease. Patients can be treated in the outpatient setting uh, with bowel rest, a light diet, and oral antibiotics. Uh, most patients, uh, most episodes of diverticulitis, in fact, can be treated very successfully uh, this way. Important to remember that you need to provide broad spectrum coverage with your oral antibiotics for gram negatives and anaerobes. Once they resolve, you then put the patient on a um, uh, dietary management plan, including high fiber diet, somewhere in the range of 25 to 30 grams per day. This helps manage their bowel habit, but it's important to note this does not completely prevent future episodes. In fact, there's not really much evidence that prevents it, but good to uh, manage their constipation uh, that they likely have. Now, some patients will prevent, present with more advanced disease and need to be admitted to the hospital. They should be treated with IV antibiotics, uh, bowel rest, uh, fluids, electrolyte support. They should be imaged with the CT scan uh, because you need to uh, uh, quantify the uh, uh, severity of their disease. You need to understand if they have an abscess, which should be drained by uh, percutaneous drainage, if they have a perforation. Patients with diverticulitis and a perforation do not necessarily need to go immediately to the operating room. Uh, 
uh, even if they have pneumoperitoneum but are otherwise stable, that can be managed with bowel rest and antibiotics. If they become unstable or symptoms are worsening, of course, they need to go to the operating room emergently. But this is one of the few settings where a colon perforation does not automatically require going to the operating room if they're otherwise stable. Most of these patients will actually uh, seal the perforation and do well. So again, uh, free perforation with peritonitis, go to the OR. Failure to respond to your non-operative management plan, meaning they're getting more pain, white count is going up, persistent fevers, tachycardia, certainly hypotension. Inability to drain an abscess by IR because there's not a safe window to drain or an IR drain is uh, simply not resolving their symptoms. Persistent phlegmon, all these things would uh, uh, be caused to go to the operating room. Some patients will present with obstruction, um, uh, obstruction of their colon because they have a significant phlegmon that's uh, causing mechanical obstruction or obstruction of surrounding organs, most often this will be the left ureter, which again can sometimes be managed uh, with ureteral stent, uh, but would also be an indication to go to the operating room. What do you do for diverticulitis in the operating room? Uh, there's a variety of choices, a one-stage operation, uh, including resection of the sigmoid colon and anastomosis. Uh, in mild disease, this is a safe choice. Um, even in more advanced disease, this can be a safe choice. Uh, I would be very cautious with doing this uh, in the setting of a board exam. If the patient is otherwise completely healthy, stable, there's not pus and stool all around, that might be a safe choice. Um, you can consider a resection and anastomosis with a proximal ileostomy. That would be an option. A two-stage procedure, meaning a Hartman's procedure, so a resection with colostomy at the first operation, and then colostomy reversal subsequently. This is um, the most common operation offered in the acute setting for diverticulitis. This is generally the safe choice. Uh, you always want to do a resection because with diverticulitis, you have to remove the septic focus. Patients may not get better unless you get their disease colon out. And also doing the colostomy, always a safe choice. Be cautious about doing an anastomosis in the acute setting, even if that's something we sometimes do in practice. And then uh, three-stage would be an option. So proximal diversion first, followed by resection, followed by stoma closure. This is mostly historical. Rarely is this employed anymore because the morbidity of this approach uh, exceeds the two-stage or Hartman's procedure. Um, uh, and rarely are you going to use this. And I don't know that this would ever be the, the answer on a board exam. Uh, laparoscopy, if you're comfortable with that, uh, is certainly acceptable, um, but it's really more about managing the resection and the anastomosis versus colostomy that you'll be questioned about. Some considerations. Um, how much colon do you resect? Uh, clearly, if there's a perforation, that segment comes out, but how far proximal and distal do you go? So all the disease-thickened colon should be removed. The proximal um, uh, line of resection should be colon that is reasonably soft and uh, uh, healthy. It's not necessary to remove all of the colon that has diverticulosis. That might result in a, in a total colectomy in some patients, but it's not necessary. Just go back as far as the soft, reasonably normal colon is. And at the distal aspect, you always want to divide at the proximal rectum. Don't leave any of the sigmoid colon intact. In fact, this is the most common reason for recurrence after a sigmoid resection. If you leave a little bit of the distal sigmoid uh, in place, that's a, a site of recurrence. So take out the entire sigmoid all the way down to the rectum. Okay. Large bowel obstruction. Uh, so a 57-year-old woman with metastatic rectosigmoid cancer presents with complete large bowel obstruction. What's the most appropriate initial step in her management? A, palliative care with NG tube decompression. B, Hartman's procedure. C, loop colostomy. D, colonic stent. E, colonoscopic argon beam ablation of tumor. Okay, D, colonic stent. That was the most common choice. Uh, several people went with loop colostomy, um, uh, which I think would be 
a choice. Uh, colonic stent, though, uh, if you or a colleague can perform it, uh, would be a, a very nice option in the setting of metastatic disease um, because the patient uh, may uh, require a uh, permanent stent just for palliative reasons uh, or may be used as a bridge to a resection with anastomosis later, depending on the patient's overall condition, requirement for chemotherapy, et cetera. And we'll talk about that. So there's a lot of reasons that patients uh, may present with large bowel obstruction. Cancer, of course, is what we worry about the most. Um, uh, volvulus, uh, as mentioned before, inflammatory disease like diverticulitis, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's, ulcerative colitis is much, much less likely to present with an obstruction as they tend not to get strictures nearly as frequently as Crohn's disease. Uh, Radiation-related strictures, hernias, of course, intussusception, ischemia, foreign body, or fecal impaction, all things to consider uh, for colon obstruction. Now, obstruction due to cancer, how is that best treated? So for right-sided lesions, these patients are best treated with uh, a right colectomy, a single-stage operation. Um, do a right colectomy, and then, it, again, depending on the overall condition of the patient, ileostomy or anastomosis. Uh, Left-sided obstruction can be managed in a variety of ways, some of which we already talked about, but to, to reiterate, three-stage um, uh, management plan of proximal diversion to alleviate the obstruction, followed by resection, followed by stoma closure. Uh, two-stage, meaning resection with a, an end colostomy, followed by colostomy takedown, or one-stage management, uh, which would be a resection with anastomosis, uh, or perhaps bridging the patient with a colonic stent followed by a resection. Um, as in the case that was uh, presented, colonic stent can be used um, for obstructing tumors with or without metastatic disease, but if patients present with malignant obstruction, if stenting is technically possible, can be a good option so that you can then fully evaluate the patient, uh, resuscitate them, and do a ball prep and get them ready for uh, an urgent operation rather than an emergent operation, which may allow you to do a, uh, a resection with anastomosis. Obviously, it's helpful for the patient to avoid a stoma if you can do so safely. On-table lavage uh, is, is certainly an option. I think is not really done by many people and has kind of fallen out of favor. Uh, can be a big mess in the operating room and not a very popular choice, but a choice uh, in lieu of a ball prep. Okay, we'll talk a bit about surgical options for ulcerative colitis. Uh, which of the following is a risk factor for the development of colorectal cancer in ulcerative colitis? Acute disease, severity of disease, use of immunosuppressive medications, duration of disease, presence of pseudopolyps. Okay, great, almost everybody. Duration of disease. So this comes up often. The risk of colorectal cancer in patients with ulcerative colitis depends primarily on the duration of disease. It's not the severity of their symptoms. Um, it's not how many medications they're on or the dose or any of that. It's really a time-related situation. Long-standing inflammation puts their colon at risk of inflammation. And whether they have just left-sided disease or pancolitis, it's the time that really matters there. Surgical options for ulcerative colitis, it depends uh, very much on how the patient is presenting to you. So patients with ulcerative colitis who are presented to you in an emergent situation, if they come in uh, sick, bleeding, obstructed, uh, any of this kind of stuff, the operation they should be offered is a total abdominal colectomy with ileostomy. And really that's, that's pretty much the only choice you should offer these people in the emergent setting. Abdominal colectomy with ileostomy. Do not do a proctectomy in the emergent setting. Tempting as it might be, even if the patient says, I'm fine with a lifetime stoma, uh, don't do a pelvic dissection in the emergent setting. This is going to put patients at higher risk of bleeding and other complications. Do the abdominal colectomy, leave the rectum in place, and then you, you can come back at a later time to do the proctectomy. Now, in the elective setting, uh, there's more choices. You can do a restorative proctocolectomy with iliopouch anal anastomosis. Um, this will be a, a definitive procedure uh, for ulcerative colitis. 
This is a uh, curable disease with proctocolectomy. Um, some patients may elect for an endiliostomy, uh, so proctocolectomy with endiliostomy is also an acceptable choice. It really depends on the patient's uh, preference and desire to have an ilioanal pouch and restore intestinal continuity, but both are, are reasonable options. Okay, surgery for constipation. So certainly less common, but sometimes uh, we require surgical treatment of constipation. So this comes um, usually in the setting of clonic dysmotility, patients who have slow transit constipation or clonic inertia. Uh, these patients can be evaluated uh, first by history. Usually they're gonna give you a history that they're refractory, refractory to laxatives. These are the people that tell you I drink five doses of Miralax every day and I still don't go. These are the people that tell you I have a bowel movement every seven to 10 days, despite daily laxatives. Um, they should be evaluated with transit time studies like a SITS marker study where they swallow the um, um, gel cap of markers and then get serial abdominal x-rays to demonstrate slow motility through the colon. They should also though be evaluated for disorders of defecation, for pelvic floor disorders. It's critical to make sure they don't have an outlet obstruction before you take out their colon. But if they're defecating normally and demonstrate slow transit constipation on their transit study, it would be uh, an option to do a colectomy. The operation these patients should be offered is a total abdominal colectomy with an ileorectal anastomosis. A segmental colectomy is not going to be uh, adequate. They need a total abdominal colectomy. Uh, certainly an ileostomy is okay, that's a good choice, although most patients will not elect to have that, but definitely a safe choice. Now, patients who have uh, disorders of defecation, pelvic floor disorders, outlet dysfunction, uh, should be evaluated um, with uh, anal physiology, like anal manometry, and with defecography, which can be done either with contrast studies, like fluoro, or with MRI looking for things like non-relaxing puborectalis or intussusception or rectoceles. Um, and mo these can be treated non-operatively uh, at first with things like pelvic floor therapy and bowel regimens, but sometimes require surgery for things like rectoceal. Irritable bowel syndrome, this comes up from time to time. Uh, patients with um, either constipation predominant, IBS, diarrhea predominant, or the mixed type. Those patients often have sort of an alternating pattern between diarrhea and constipation. Um, of course, you should avoid surgery on these patients uh, by all means. You cannot cure these patients uh, of their irritable bowel. Um, conservative measures, there's a variety of medical treatments available. All of them work for some patients, none of them work for all the patients. Um, but avoid surgery on people with irritable bowel. All right, and this last couple of slides has some uh, photos of uh, colectomy. For the purposes of this exam, usually if you want to offer somebody an open operation or a laparoscopic operation, uh, both are, are going to be acceptable choices, but just to make sure everybody's familiar with laparoscopic colectomy, uh, this set has a, a few photos uh, of some of the important points. So this is a series of photos looking at laparoscopic right colectomy. Important that when doing a laparoscopic colectomy, you follow the same principles as with open surgery. So for example here, viewing the cecum here in the background, important to identify uh, the major vascular, vascular pedicle, the ileocolic pedicle here, and do high ligation of the pedicle to ensure adequate lymph node harvest. Um, as you're looking up towards the liver, careful mobilization of the duodenum. Uh, when doing a right colectomy, uh, duodenal injury is going to be one of the uh, common uh, injuries, and so careful and early identification of the duodenum and, and sweeping it away from the mesocolon will help stay out of trouble. Um, whether you choose to exteriorize your specimen or do intracorporeal is sort of your choice. For the purpose of this, you should, uh, it, it doesn't really matter uh, as long as you're doing the right operation. Other, um, these are more technical tips. You know, for the, for the written examination, the conduct of the operation is not, not important as it is for the oral examination where you're asked to describe specifically how you would conduct operations. 
uh, subtotal colectomy. We've mentioned this operation several times. This is going to be the operation for acute ulcerative, ulcerative colitis, for constipation, for patients with um, polyposis, like FAP with rectal sparing, uh, some patients with Lynch syndrome, subtotal colectomy with ileorectal anastomosis. Um, and then last in, or almost last in here, uh, J-pouch surgery, we talked about that as a treatment for ulcerative colitis, uh, and also a good treatment for familial adenomatous polyposis. FAP patients do well with the total proctal colectomy and J-pouch. The colectomy and proctectomy would be done as standard. Not everybody does a J-pouch uh, that often, so this is just really to remind ourselves of how that's uh, constructed. The terminal ilium is uh, fashioned into a J, uh, stapler or sutures, but most often stapler is used to create the anastomosis within uh, the two limbs of the ilium, and then that is either hand sewn or stapled as an ilioanal anastomosis. And last on here, there's some technical things about how to create a colostomy, but again, I think the technical details of colostomy creation or closure are probably not so relevant for the uh, purpose of the written exam. Okay, so that completes the slides for large intestine. We do have a bit of time left for questions, so happy to have any questions if, if you should have them. So the question is, after three episodes of uncomplicated diverticulitis, uh, should we offer colectomy or not? So um, there's definitely a, a trend towards less aggressive surgical management of uncomplicated diverticulitis. It seems as if patients' worst episode tends to be at their first presentation. So their first one is the worst one. The subsequent episodes seem to be the same or less severe. That's not 100% true, of course. Um, and so in patients who have had uh, multiple episodes of uncomplicated, you're probably fine to continue to observe them. Uh, it depends a bit on the patient-specific uh, situation. So if they... Um, for example, uh, you know, travel to remote areas, they can't afford to have an episode. Sure, you can do an elective operation to prevent th them from finding themselves in a bad situation. But um, now for complicated diverticulitis, uh, people tend to still offer surgical therapy a little bit more liberally because they've had abscesses, fistulas, et cetera, that need to be uh, either treated or prevented. Uh, so your question is surrounding the management of enterocutaneous fistula. Uh, always a difficult problem. So um, if asked a question about enterocutaneous fistula, you always want to focus first on optimizing the patient. So nutrition, whether that's oral or uh, TPN, wound care management, optimizing medical comorbidities. Don't take those patients to the operating room right away. Delay treatment as much as you can. Uh, but then do operate on them when necessary. So it depends a little bit on the etiology. So if it's Crohn's, optimize their Crohn's. If it's a malignant fistula, evaluate them for metastatic disease. Um, but in general, don't operate on those people right away. Nutrition, wound care, medical management, all that stuff first. So the question was, in a patient with a complete colon obstruction, is it safe uh, and acceptable to do colonic stenting? Uh, yes, it is. You also ask, is that available everywhere? No, not necessarily, um, and that's okay. So if that's not something you practice at your hospital because perhaps you or the GI colleagues don't do that, that's fine. Those patients can undergo an operation, whether it's diversion or resection depends on the case. But yes, uh, it, there's plenty of data supporting the safety and utility of stenting. Now, it's not always possible. If somebody has truly complete obstruction, they cannot be stented. So they have to have a minimal lumen available to place a stent through. Yes, it would be safe to try that as an option. Yes, sir. So the question is about um, microsatellite instability. So MSI um, stable versus unstable tumors will help with the prognosis of that patient. In general, what you're gonna be asked about are who needs post-operative chemotherapy. Most often it's gonna be a decision of node negative versus no positive. Patients with metastatic nodes should get chemotherapy. Those with negative 
uh, usually do not. Exceptions might be patients with T4 disease, so invasion of bladder or whatever surrounding organs um, would perhaps be offered chemotherapy. Patients with uh, genetic syndromes, uh, risk factors, sometimes oncologists will offer them. Patients with MSI stable uh, are going to have a worse prognosis than MSI instability, and oncologists would consider those higher risk tumors and consider offering them chemotherapy. Usually the question you're going to be asked, though, is surrounding, uh, regarding lymph node status, though. have a worse prognosis. So the, right. So the people with um, Lynch syndrome who have instability have actually a better prognosis stage for stage. Why is that? I don't know. <laughs> I do not know. Other questions? So patients with Lynch syndrome, if they're in that uh, sort of type 1 description, should they still have a subtotal or a segmental resection? Uh, they should be offered subtotal. Um, patients oftentimes will choose a segmental resection, but they should be offered subtotal, again, because uh, patients have upwards of 50% chance of um, subsequent colon cancer, and that's obviously a very high risk, and that's been demonstrated to be dramatically reduced with subtotal. It doesn't go to zero if they have their rectum, of course, um, but the more colon you take out, the more you can lower the risk of subsequent cancer. Oh, GIST. Yes, so the treatment for GIST of the rectum is, yes, complete surgical excision. So that sometimes will mean a local excision, like with a transanal excision, which can be done by um, traditional Transanal surgery sometimes can be done with newer techniques like TEM, transanal endoscopic microsurgery, um, if it's possible. If not, then a radical excision like LAR or APR would be indicated. Now, that depends on the size and the location, uh, but usually the main thing that you have to decide is um, tr excision versus uh, GLEVAC versus observation. But excision is the answer. So whether you can do that transanally or with an LAR just kind of depends on the size and location. Okay, very good. Uh, so we will take a break.